I didn't always think I was going to be a conductor. Uh, when I was very, very little, one of the first pieces of essay that I wrote, I actually wrote that I wanted to be a bus driver. Um, but since then, and growing up a little bit and thinking more serious about it, yes, conducting was always something that I, would, I really wanted to do, I would love to have been able to do, um, which I'm luckily doing now. But the other thing I would love to be able to do is to fly. Um, and thankfully, I was very fortunate to, to, to have achieved that ambition, but more as a hobby uh, a few years ago when I got my license. So I suppose um, conducting is something that is a passion, it's a job, but it also is helping fuel the other passion and ambition of mine, which is to fly planes. My route into conducting um, started when I was at school. I actually grew up in Hong Kong um, and I went to a, an, an, not an international school, but an, but an English speaking school. And one of the very important things in the curriculum was music and playing in an orchestra. Every year there would be um, about a month's time when we would essentially dedicate um, our schooling career into playing in an orchestra and working on just a very short program, very intensively, to uh, actually at the expense of lessons. Um, and at that time, being a horn player, sort of caught the bug of watching the conductor thinking, what, what is it about this mystique that you are doing through non-verbal communications with somehow affecting the sound and generating an energy across 80 people. Um, so that fascination then took me um, into, from curiosity into a passion. And so I sort of set my sight into one day trying my hands at conducting. Um, so when I moved here, um, I decided to try and pursue, pursue that as much as possible. Um, and the first step when I was at school, speaking to my music teacher to say, um, I really want to be a conductor. Um, being the schooling system it was, they said, well, the best way for you to do that would be if you could win an organ scholarship at one of the universities, and then you get to conduct choirs every week. Um, one of the unique things about the British conservatoire system is that there is no undergraduate um, education for conductors. Um, so that would have been a really easy and useful way to gain podium time. Um, with one small catch in that when we had that conversation, I didn't actually play the organ. Um, and so I had to learn the organ very quickly um, and I did the audition and thankfully I won the audition and I won an organ scholarship and from there on I was able to have regular podium time with the choir and then the standard route if you like of conservatoire and then practical experience started and the rest is freelancing and here I am. So the very first time um, I was paid to do a gig um, was actually nothing to do with ballet or the theatre at all. It was to conduct a brass band. Um, being trained at the Royal Northern College of Music, um, brass banding was a real culture um, up in the north of England. Um, and in trying to gain experience outside of music college, um, it was the natural and easy opportunity to find. Um, they paid me £25 for rehearsal and £25 for the performance. Um, and the first concert was in this church, which was completely packed, um, full of really enthusiastic punters um, who were really excited by the prospects of this communal way of music making and this brass band that was very much a focal point of the community. Um, so regardless of the music and the pay and everything, it was a really interesting way in to understanding the sense of community music making and also how important this job is, even though it was a job for me to go and do a gig, but for all the people in that church, in that concert, it was a real communal and important bonding experience. Conducting for ballet was something that I never thought I would do. Um, I fell into it by accident, um, if you like. Um, as a lot of um, young conductors do after your music college training, um, you apply for competitions, you apply for fellowships and assistantships with orchestras. Um, and this incredible opportunity with Birmingham Royal Ballet came up um, to be their conducting fellow. I apply for it, not knowing anything about ballet at all. In fact, I think up to that point, I had seen one ballet performance in my life. It was a Swan Lake in Hong Kong, and I don't think I remember very much from it. Um, and I did the audition. Um, I was fortunate to have, to have won the audition. Um, and over the course of the two years, that fellowship run jointly with Rombert Dance Company, actually, gave me experience in classical ballet, 
uh, but also with Ron Bear also con in contemporary dance, which is a very important part um, of the dance music making, because I think the two strands are quite different. And that almost like a complete start, complete education, I think was a really useful way to prepare me into the world of ballet. And once I got started, I think there was no way back. I really enjoyed it. Um, I enjoyed being with both the companies and the both companies tolerated me. Um, and then I went back immediately to both companies as a guest and the rest is history, as they say. I get asked very often, um, how much am I or c should a conductor be willing to bend and compromise uh, for the choreography and for the dancers? Um, particularly, sometimes you are asked to do things which um, is quite different to what the composer wrote. Um, and I find that to be a question which I often return an answer with actually just, just a purely musical um, experience, which is when you accompany a singer um, or a virtuoso instrumentalist in a concerto, um, often they are asked, um, often they ask the conductor um, to give them a bit of space so that they can really execute something that is virtuosic, that is very impressive, or that they are really precious about in the performance. I think it's much the same as it is in dance, uh, particularly when one considers that this whole idea of the score made composed by the composer being absolutely sacrosanct is a relatively modern concept. Um, we know that composers like Beethoven and Haydn, they would have in indeed encouraged their performers, and you have historic accounts of them performing themselves, to encourage everybody who performed the music to take liberty with the score so that it's not something that is set like a historical piece of artifact that is unyielding, but it is something that lives and is living and is always changing. And so when you bring an element of dance and a whole new, a whole different art form and genre into it, um, it's really exciting that you can have music influenced by somebody who doesn't speak music but it's bringing something that helps the public, the audience, hear the music almost in a different way. Um, so, you know, so take an example of, say, a solo at the end of a, of a, of a classical grand pas, the girl solo. And yes, the composer never wrote for the second set of fuetes to be quicker than the first set. Um, but if it gives that piece of music an added sense of excitement by having that elevated sense of thrill, um, but that is compounded, not just by what the people hear, but by what they also see. And the whole package, which should hopefully, one really excited piece of fireworks. Um, and it's exactly the same thing in Najaj. If somebody looks beautiful with stunning lines, of course, and they're really on their leg, and you give them a bit of space so that they can indulge a little bit. Um, if anything, you could almost convince anybody that the music could be played in any way, so long as you come up with a musical solution to it. Of course, there are times when we have to say, look, this is just not practical. Um, an orchestra cannot do that, or a musician does not have enough breath or enough bow, all that sort of stuff. But I think particularly when one is working with choreographers who are musical, dancers who are musical and who understand the sense of phrasing, um, then it's always a joy to have those conversations and it never becomes a compromise. It becomes a creative conversation. I think one of the things that I find really interesting and dancers use this phrase all the time and I, 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 I'm still trying to suss out exactly what it means. But um, So they always say to us as conductors and musicians who work in dance that the music goes through them. Um, when, you, when they hear the music, they, they, they feel it going through them on stage, literally almost like um, the music going through the pit from the orchestra pit up to the stage. And I've always sort of mused on that phrase for a very long time. And recently, um, after um, a very long period of, of just going from one place to another, I actually went to the gym um, and I was on the treadmill and I was trying to run um, a 30 minute, you know, see how far I can get and all that sort of stuff. And at the end of that 30 minutes, it was got two minutes to go, and I was really trying to get to the end and really push that last couple of minutes. And I just turned the music up. Um, and that music propelled me to the end of that, and it sort of pushed me through physically. And that was the moment that clicked with me and thought, yes, the music went through me. Um, so even though I was listening to the music, 
as, uh, as a musician, if you like. I was listening to the pulse, I was listening to the melody, I was listening to the changing of the harmony. But there was a more physical and visual reaction to the music simply through the fact that I was engaged in something really physical um, that almost bypassed that intellectual sense of listening. Um, and it became a direct reaction, a feeling of the pulse, of the phrasing, of the energy of the music. And so not being a dancer myself, not even being an athlete myself, um, I think that's one small way that I try and rel relate to when they say, I need the music to give me that energy. I need to hear the um, phrasing of it. I need to hear the space of it so that it can help me do what I need to do. Um, and then, I, and I think it, it's that sense of bypassing the more um, academic, intellectual, connoisseur way of listening to the music, of thinking, oh yeah, this, this harmony goes here and this note is short and all, oh, isn't that so interesting that um, the dynamic is like that. It's something more immediate. Um, and so how that translates to us making music and in making decisions about how to play something and how to rehearse and prepare the orchestra for it um, would be simply a sense of making decisions so that we can retain that energy and help the music go through them and help them engage in the incredible physicality and athleticism and artistry that they need to do. People often ask <laughs> what a conductor actually does. Um, you sort of just wave a stick about and things seem to happen around you and, 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 and it's, it's easy, some, some things are obvious. You know, you give somebody a cue and they start to play um, or you give a gesture of quieter, softer and, and that sort of happens. But I think at all times it's balancing the three things which are um, listening to what the musicians are giving you and bearing in mind that um, often you're working with musicians who are who are who've probably played that piece many many times and are world-class artists in their own right so you're listening to what these world-class musicians are giving you when they're playing and also having a feeling of how they are reacting with each other and what they're listening out to amongst themselves um, and how they are physically responding to each other's playing and then the third thing is to then interject with your gesture, especially in a performance where you don't get to say anything at all, and to say, actually, look, it's, you need to listen to this bit, or um, it, the climax is not there yet. And so then over the course of my career so far, um, one develops a, a toolkit almost of things that have worked before, um, or you learn from things that didn't work before, um, so when I started, for example, I used to inject a lot of energy um, at the orchestra at all times, and just constantly giving them and flailing, um, if you like. Um, and I, I had to work quite hard to minimise all that and to go, actually, if you were... Because when we work, when, when we wave our arms, we're essentially talking, we're saying something. Um, and if you wave it really big, then you're talking very loudly. But if you talk really loudly to an orchestra, wave really big to them all, at, all the time, um, then they sort of start to block you out. So one of the things I learned, for example, is that um, I, I, I learned to really minimise what I do um, a lot of times and just really go back to that first point of listening. And at that really important moment when you really want to affect something, then you come out and do something. Working in ballet means that um, Sometimes the choice of music, in fact, oftentimes, it's not up to you as the music director, conductor, or whatever role that you take within that particular production. Um, so that means sometimes you have to play music that isn't necessary, things that you are always passionate about. Or indeed, working in the theatre means that um, you have to do the same piece 10, 20, 30 times. Um, and so sometimes I get asked how you um, go about working in such in pieces that you don't necessarily like or how do you keep it fresh uh, with scores that is that you've played many many times um, and I think that it's 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 always about um, one um, cr getting the, the the most creativity out of um, your musicians because I think if it's a piece of, piece of music that you don't necessarily like as a conductor, someone in the orchestra, or more, even just as importantly, someone in the company, the choreographer, the dancer, will absolutely love that piece of music. 
and is channeling their passion for it and go, so what, what do you love so much about that piece of music? Sometimes they say, oh, it's really emotional um, or they really like the color of it. And so then it makes you realize that yes, you might not be the number, cha number one champion for this composer or this score, but someone else really loves it. And, and, and there, there is an important role in being the conductor of lifting that, lifting that score off the page and making it a really valuable and beautiful performance because it will touch somebody. Um, and it's exactly the same thing when it comes to that question of repeating a score many times. It may be your 20th, 200th, 2000th time of doing the Nutcracker or whatever, but it's inevitably always going to be somebody's first. And so to make it sound fresh every night and interesting every night, is just as important for the person who's coming in for the first time as it is for the person who's playing it for the 500th time. Because yes, the person who's coming here for the first time, they'll get excited about it because it's their first encounter with it. But if you are able to make the person who's heard it hundreds of times really engage with that score, then you'll get that energy out of the performance that will then make it fresh for the company as well, bearing in mind that they may have danced it many, many times already. So I've been here in Amsterdam for a month now working on the Hans van Manen Festival celebrating the great master's 90th birthday and uh, last night we had the opening night of the month-long fe festival celebrating um, Hans's work um, and it's been a real privilege to be part of this um, conducting for the main tour um, as well as doing the opening last night um, for so many reasons, it's a fantastic company. It's a wonderful orchestra um, that is the head ballet orchestra. Um, and it's all choreography that is incredibly musical. Um, it, Hans always chooses really great pieces of music that is a joy to play, a joy to conduct. Um, and he choreographs in a way that is always um, a joy to provide inspiration for. He always finds a little bit of something that um, isn't the obvious um, and I love the way he focuses on the human relationships in his choreography as well so that you know we, we play the um, Britain's Frank Bridge variation last night a piece that Britain wrote um, in dedication to his teacher Frank Bridge um, and there's a really set story history biographical background to the piece but his choreography finds an extra layer to it where it's, it's, it's about all these interpersonal relationships and a relation, uh, the, the human emotions within a big group of people. And it's a theme that I've found in all the pieces that I've conducted, Concertante, um, Grosse Fuga and Metaphoren, that it permeates through all of them. And I, I find that extra human level a real inspiration when it comes to our music making, because it really gives us that extra dimensions of emotions and affectations that we can bring to our music making. Some of the things that have not gone exactly to plan um, on the podium uh, <laughs> is a pretty extensive catalogue of blooper reels. I think um, I've, um, I've, I've, I've let my baton go at the end of a performance at Saddlers Wells. I remember having to ask the stage management to very kindly go and fetch it um, from Rosette somewhere. Um, there was a time, it, this wasn't quite in the performance, but it was, it was pretty spectacular as blunders go. Um, I was um, in, in, a, in, in a general rehearsal, I think it was, and I was like um, just turning the page through, a, you know, we were just going through a performance in a, what is a particularly complex moment um, in the ballet rhythmically, um, where every bar has a different time signature to it. And I was just conducting and I was thinking about something, I was watching and I wasn't really thinking at the time, um, about what was in front of me at all and I think I turned five pages at once and I just started conducting what was in front of me and gradually everything deteriorated around me and all I heard the next the first sign that I realized I was like oh this is not going terribly well but I don't know what's going on and then I heard a no 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 from one of the members of the orchestra and then I unfortunately had to stop that general performance um, thankfully I, I still have a wonderful relationship with that company but um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was one of the things that um, was, was uh, it, it will always stick in my mind as, 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 as an infamous blunder in my career. I remember walking onto stage actually for my debut run um, at the Opera House. Um, and this was only after the general. I think it was the first time, because after the general you have to go and take your curtain call. I think that was the first time me going up for a bow at the Opera House. And, um, you know, I went on 
took my bow and joined the lineup and everything, and then curtain closed. And I remember going down to the cafe thinking, okay, that went, that went okay. And I had a tap on my shoulder, and this gentleman said to me, oh, wonderful performance. I, I saw you coming on to take a bow, but what did you actually do?